Could I just ask those who are just joining if they could put themselves on mute, please? Very good. Right, well, we'll get, we'll get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I, would ask, I would just ask everyone uh, other than our speaker <laughs> to put themselves on mute. Um, Re record, William. I am recording. Well done, Edward. I am recording. Uh, if I could ask everyone else to put themselves on mute, um, I will uh, just admitting people as they come in. Um, it's with great pleasure I uh, uh, welcome you here this evening uh, to uh, a lecture by uh, Dr. Michael McDonald, who's very kindly agreed to give us uh, the benefit of his 45 years experience uh, working on uh, languages, scripts, and rock art of Arabia, Jordan, and Southern Syria. I think Dr. Michael McDonald is the expert on the, on the subject and he's going to talk to us tonight on the curious history of written Arabic. Um, Doc, Dr. McDonald is a, uh, is a fellow of the British Academy, fellow of Wolfson College, Oxford, and a trustee of the International Association for the Study of Arabia. So we're honored to have him uh, speak to us uh, this evening on the uh, curious history of written Arabic there will, we hope, be some uh, time at the end of his lecture for, for some questions. Uh, if you do have any uh, questions, I would ask you to just uh, put them in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, if you go to the chat box, I'll keep an eye out for any questions and we can put those to Dr. McDonald uh, at, at the end of his lecture. Um, so if I could remind everyone who's just joined us, if you please put your uh, please put uh, please put your mute button on so that you don't come keep coming uh, uh, into uh, into view and also uh, uh, interrupting the lecture. So if everyone can go on mute, I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. McDonald uh, to uh, uh, for his lecture on the curious history of written Arabic. Dr. McDonald, is that can you see? Yep, my screen. I can I can see you, can't see, yet see your screen. Oh, um, so, wait a minute, I have to do show navigator. Um, oops, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Don't worry. Uh, try again. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, I have to share screen first, don't I? Yeah. Uh, there you go. That's coming up. Here you go. Perfect. Uh, now you need to play. So we can uh, see your screen now. Is that? Can you see the first slide now? Yep. Yeah, it's all yours. Off all right. you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I'm I'm very honoured to have been asked to to lecture to you, and uh, it's extremely kind of you to to invite me. Uh, so I hope uh, this uh, won't uh, be uh, boring for for, for you. Uh, uh, and um, I welcome questions and uh, uh, disagreements and uh, 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 virulent verbal attacks uh, if necessary at the end. <laughs> um, Right. Language and writing are two quite different things, though they're often confused. There's no necessary connection between them, and many languages have survived purely in speech without their users feeling the need to write them down. When a particular event makes it necessary to write something, the speaker has the choice of either asking someone literate in another language to write it for them, or, much more rarely, of trying to express what they want to say in their own tongue using the script of the nearest written language. 
Thus, for centuries or more, the speakers of the non-Arabic modern South Arabian languages in Oman and Yemen, Sheri or Jibali, Mehri, Sokotri, etc., never found it necessary to write their spoken languages. On the rare occasions when something did need to be written, they would ask a literate Arabic speaker to write it for them in Arabic. Now, however, with the arrival of the mobile phone, many speakers of modern South Arabian languages want to text in their own, own tongue, and so they learn enough, enough of the Arabic script to transcribe their language on the keys of the phone. Although the Arabic script is not particularly suitable for this, that is irrelevant to these texters, and I shall come back to this later. My story begins with the earliest reference to people called Arabs in 853 BC. As many of you will know, this is the Assyrian report that Gindibu the Arab joined 11 other leaders from Syria and Palestine at the Battle of Karkar uh, to fight Assyrian expansion in certain northern Syria. It seems likely that he would only have done so if he felt threatened by this expansion, and so he was probably from an area in Syria rather than in what we think of as the Arabian Peninsula. From the 8th century BC until roughly the 1st century AD, we find references to Arabs and Arabias all around the Fertile Crescent and on the northern and eastern borders of the peninsula, but not in what we today think of as Arabia. Indeed, in looking at the history of the Arabs, it's very important to remember the, the principle enunciated by Herodotus in the fifth century BC that, quote, Egypt is all that country which is inhabited by Egyptians, just as Cilicia and Assyria are the countries inhabited by Cilicians and Assyrians, uh, unquote. I.e. that for the Greeks, a country took its name from its inhabitants, not the other way around. This means that before the first century AD, Arabia, in the writings of Greek and Roman sources, meant any place where there were people whom they called Arabs. This does not mean that these places were populated only by Arabs, but this was where the Arabs they happened to be talking about lived. As you can see on the map, these ancient Greek and Roman writers found Arabs, and hence lots of different Arabias, over a huge area of the Fertile Crescent from Eastern Egypt up through Syria and down through Mesopotamia to the Gulf. Ironically, the only part of the peninsula which are uh, of the peninsula, which our Greek and Latin sources called Arabia, was Arabia Felix, modern Yemen. And this was based on a misunderstanding. The peoples of the South Arabian kingdoms of Saba, Ma'in, Qataban, and Hadramaut were not Arabs in any sense and would not have appreciated being identified with them. The reason that the Greeks and Romans thought they were Arabs was a result of the trade in frankincense and other aromatics, which were either grown in or imported into South Arabia, and then brought up the western side of the peninsula and sold in the Levant, Egypt, and the Mediterranean countries by Arab merchants. By a very common mental process, the purchasers associated the merchandise with the merchants and so assumed it was produced uh, by the same people who sold it. Thus, one of the earliest references to frankincense in Greek literature calls it the Arabian vapor. It's important to realize that it is because of this mistake that the whole peninsula eventually came to be called Arabia in the literature of Greco-Roman conquerors of the Levant and their successors, the Byzantines, and the early Islamic empire up to the present day. In fact, we have very little evidence for what the ancient populations of the peninsula north of Yemen called themselves, or the areas in which they live. But we know, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Uh, but we know that in the first millennium BC, the inhabitants of Tema and Dadan called their oases by these names, and it's clear that neither of them regarded themselves as Arabs or wrote in the Arabic language. 
A major problem in studying the history of the Arabic language is that while there are many references to Arabs and Arabias in places all around the Fertile Crescent in Egypt, we do not know what, what it was that identified these different peoples with very different ways of life as Arabs. Some were prosperous merchants, others tax collectors, peasant farmers and small landowners, market gardeners, brigands, school teachers, founders and restorers and rulers of cities, kings with large numbers of chariots, guards, policemen, soldiers and paramilitaries, breeders of sheep and goats, and finally, camel, camel breeding nomads. So clearly the term Arab cannot have re referred to a particular way of life. What I've suggested in an article called Arabs, Arabias and Arabic before late antiquity is that if we think today of what defines people as Arabs from Morocco to Iraq, it is a loose, imprecise complex of language and culture. I would suggest that the same was probably true in antiquity, both among those who thought of themselves as Arabs and those who called them Arabs. It is clear that the term Arab came from the people themselves because writers in many different languages, both Semitic and non-Semitic, used the same word. But maddeningly, these Arabs have left us only the tiniest, tiniest clues as to what, their, uh, what language they spoke. And until the very end of the first millennium BC, more than 800 years after Gindibu, the first Arab to be mentioned in historical records. Even the handful of documents up to this time in which Arab is a self-designation are all in Greek, except for one which is in the ancient South Arabian language of Hadramitic. Indeed, our only evidence that these Arabs spoke something akin to what we would recognize as Arabic are three words in 800 years. Two are the words Naka, female camel, and Bakr, young male camel, in the Assyrian annals of Tiglath-Pileser III, 744 to 727 BC. And the third is the word Luban, frankincense, which is found in the Greek poetry of Sappho in the sixth century BC. The last is particularly interesting because the word occurs in Arabic, the language of the merchants, but not in ancient South Arabian, the language of the producers. Thus, we can only guess at the language spoken by the diverse peoples who were called Arabs, since they have left us no writings. Most of them, in eastern Egypt, the Fertile Crescent and central Syria and Mesopotamia, lived in areas where, by the 6th century BC, Aramaic had become the spoken and written lingua franca, thanks to its use by the Babylonians uh, and the Persian Achaemenids as their language of government throughout their multilingual empires. Aramaic is relatively easy to learn, particularly if you already speak another Semitic language, and so it spread widely. For ex example, at Tema, which had its own language, which was not closely related to uh, Arabic and its own script, Aramaic was probably used by those merchants who traveled to the Levant. However, it became the general written language of Tema when the last king of Babylon, Nabonidus, conquered North Arabia and settled in Tema for 10 years of his 17 year reign, 552 to 543 BC. After this, the use of Temanitic seems to die out rather quickly for public inscriptions like gravestones and is replaced by Aramaic throughout the oasis. Curiously, in Dadan, modern Alula, the other uh, great oasis of Northwest Arabia, which was also conquered by Nabonidus, the native language and script was maintained and the number of pre nabataean Aramaic inscriptions is relatively small. Yet, when its rulers conquered Taman, all their official inscriptions, and even the graffiti of two of their kings, were written in Aramaic. So while Arabic may have been widely spoken in the Arabias, in Eastern Egypt, the Levant, Syria, Mesopotamia, and possibly parts of the Eastern Gulf coast, it uh, I mean, yes, I mean the Western Gulf Coast, sorry. <laughs> it existed within societies uh, in which Aramaic was the normal and prestige written language. This might explain why Arabic remained a purely spoken language for so long. 
Ironically, this is a very similar situation to that of the modern South Arabian spoken languages today, I mentioned earlier, in areas where if you needed to write, you got a scribe to do so for you in Arabic. The concept of the al alphabet seems to have been invented only once in the second millennium BC. Shortly after the invention, it seems to have split into two families, which developed in parallel, as you can see on, on the screen. One was the Northwest Semitic or Phoenicio Aramaic family on the left, from which all but one of the traditional alphabets today are descended. The other was the South Semitic family of alphabets on the right which was used exclusively in the Arabian Peninsula and its neighbors. Its only modern descendant is the vocalized alphabet used in Ethiopia for languages like Ge'ez and Amharic, etc. The use of this South Semitic family uh, of alphabets was accompanied by widespread literacy in a number of different languages used in the peninsula. For example, the Musnad and Zabur scripts in blue on the slides, slide uh, were used in ancient South Arabia to write the four major languages there, Sabaic, Minaic, Katabanic, and Hadramitic. In Northwest Arabia, other varieties of this script family in green were used to write the non-Arabic languages of Tema, Dadan, and possibly Duma. But the most remarkable thing was the use of South Semitic alphabets by the nomads in purple from the deserts of Southern Syria, Jordan, and across the western two thirds of the peninsula down into Yemen. Nomads usually don't have much use for writing, especially in antiquity, when papyrus was expensive outside Egypt and they had more urgent uses for the leather from their animals. In settled areas, most people used broken pottery to write on, rather as we use scrap paper. But the nomads carried little, if any, pottery just because it got broken in the mobile life. Nevertheless, between roughly the first century BC and the fourth century AD, the nomads of this area learned to read and write and covered the desert rocks with their graffiti. We can only guess why or how they learned to write, but the following is one possibility. Curiosity is a survival instinct in the desert. If you aren't curious, you don't learn about the things that can help you stay alive and the things that can hurt or kill you. This is combined with the excellent memories which non-literates need in order to store all the information which we write down or simply Google when we need it. If a non-literate nomad was visiting an oasis in North Arabia and saw one, someone writing a, letter, a receipt or a letter, he might well have asked, what are you doing? And if the answer was not too grumpy, might have said, will you teach me to do that? Having had the letters drawn for him with the sounds they represented, he would have returned to the desert and no doubt shown his friends and relations his new skill, drawing the letters in the dust or the sand. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, dust or sand. Um, I've had this experience with a young Bedouin on a dig in Jordan, who seeing me writing in my notebook, asked me to teach him to write. I wrote the, out the letters of the Arabic alphabet in their unjoined forms, and the next day he was writing his name and my name, still in these unjoined forms. A similar situation occurred on the excavations at Tel Adawer, Lachish in Palestine in the 1930s. When the famous, famous Lachish letters written in ink on potsherds were found, there was great excitement about, among both the archeologists and the Bedouin workers. Since, since they were showing such interest, one of the archeologists, uh, Gerald Blankster Harding, taught them the Paleo-Hebrew script. Within hours, they were sending him and each other notes in their Arabic dialect expressed in the Paleo-Hebrew script. And this, despite the fact that the script had only 22 letters of the 27 consonants in their Arabic dialect. Unfortunately, none of these notes was preserved. But if it by, it by chance one should be found by archeologists, I dread to think of the effect this might have on Semitic historical linguistics. But for the ancient nomads, having learned how to express their spoken language in writing, albeit without any vowels at all and no spaces between words, there was the question of what to do with it. 
the nomad society was perfectly adapted to a non-literate condition where memory and speech were used for record and communication. But there was one important thing for which writing could be useful, relieving the boredom when you were by yourself watching the flocks and herds pasturing, the normal daily activity of most men and often women. Before this, they had often passed the time by carving pictures on the rocks, and now they could sign their drawings. Better still, they could now carve graffiti, uh, giving their names and saying what they were doing. Uh, sorry, say, saying what they were doing, expressing their hopes and fears, mentioning the news from within their tribe or from the wider world, and adding prayers, almost always for security, but also for rain, a change of circumstances, booty if they were on a raid, reunion with loved ones, etc. There are tens of thousands of these graffiti, and they give us a detailed picture of the way of life, social structures, political events, both within the desert and in the settled areas, and above all, the personal feelings of these individual nomads, something which we do not have for any of their urban or rural, contemporary, rural contemporaries. It's important to realize that writing was regarded purely as a pastime, and so it was not taught formally in schools, but simply spread informally from one person to another. We know this, uh, sorry, we know this because we have a number of texts which simply consist of all the letters of the alphabet. Each of these is in a different order, and none is in one of the two traditional orders, the abjad, for the Phoenicia Aramaic alphabet and the Halhan uh, for the Semit South Semitic one, both shown at the bottom of the slide. Formal schooling, uh, formal schooling relies on a particular letter order like R, A, B, C, but with informal transmission, the one who's instructing, in inverted commas, just carves the letters as he or she remembers them or groups them roughly according to shape, marked by the colored boxes on the slides. slide. This is what we find in these examples of the alphabet. Each has a different grouping of letters according to how the instructor thought of them or remembered them. As my friend and colleague Ahmed al Jalad has shown recently, some at least of the ancient nomads who became literate spoke dialects of Arabic. And so their graffiti provide us with the first evidence of Arabic in writing, albeit in a quite different script from the one we are used to. In fact, it was in many ways a far clearer and more suitable script because it had a distinct letter for each of the 28 consonants in Arabic. And so there were, was no need for dots. But as I've said, suitability is very seldom the reason a particular script comes to be used for a particular language. While these nomads in what is now Southern Syria, Jordan and Northern Saudi Arabia were writing their Arabic dialects, we find speakers of a different Arabic dialect among the settled peoples. These are the Nabataeans, a tribe of Arab nomads who settled in what is now Southern Jordan at the end of the fourth century BC and made their capital of Petra. Gradually over the next two centuries, they expanded their kingdom northwards into Southern Syria and southwards into Northwest Arabia. Through their involvement, with the northern uh, part of the, sorry, my, uh, through their involvement in the northern end of the frankincense trade, they became immensely rich and developed a very glamorous urban culture, as can be seen at Petra and Madain Saleh, as well as innovative agricultural methods. In Jordan and southern Syria, they had settled in areas where for hundreds of years, Aramaic had been the official language, both of government and of culture. And even when Greek became the language of gov government after Alexander the Great's conquests and the establishment of, of the Seleucid and Ptolemaic empires, Aramaic remained the language of civilized discourse in areas which resisted the conquerors. It's worth noting that end of the, at the end of the fourth century BC, after the Seleucid ruler Antigonus the One-Eyed sent a force to attack the Nabataeans at a time when they were still largely nomadic, they set it, sent him a letter of complaint in Aramaic, not Greek. To the Nabataeans and other settled civilized peoples, Arabic was a purely spoken language, 
and there was no way of writing in it. This did not mean that they despised it, simply that they did not see how it could be written. Even those who knew that the local nomads could write Arabic in their particular scripts, and a few Nabataeans clearly did know this because they wrote or dictated a handful of graffiti in one of the nomad scripts, Safiyiti, in which they identify themselves as the Nabataean. Even these people seem to have regarded both the nomads' dialects, which were different from Nabataean Arabic, and their scripts as not something they would want to use in a civilized society. And yet, it's clear that spoken Arabic played a major part in Nabataean life. On a rock in the Negev desert, not far from the Nabataean town of Oboda, there is a six line graffito in which the first three and the last lines are in Aramaic and invoke blessings on the author and those who read his work. But the fourth and fifth lines are in Arabic, written in the Nabataean Aramaic script. I have suggested that they are a quotation from the Arabic liturgy in praise of the divine Abudas. If correct, this would strongly suggest that the religious liturgy was in Arabic and was passed down orally from one generation of priests to another. This would fit with what the Greek writer Epiphanius tells us a couple of centuries later, i.e. that the religious liturgies at Petra and a town in the Negev called Elusa were in Arabic. Similarly, the so-called Babatha Papari, some of the legal documents belonging to a Jewish woman living at the southern end of the Dead Sea in the first and second centuries AD, are written in Nabataean Aramaic, since they are official papers from before the Nabataean kingdom was annexed by the Romans in AD 106. Here, strings of Aramaic legal terms are followed by their equivalents in the Arabic language written in the Nabataean Aramaic script. This shows that there was a functioning Arabic legal vocabulary, and I have suggested that this implies that in Nabataean courts, the spoken proceedings may have been held in Arabic, but recorded in Aramaic, just as in medieval English courts, the proceedings were held in English or Norman French, but recorded in Latin. If I'm correct, this suggests that the Nabataeans maintained their ancestral language, Arabic, as a purely spoken tongue and used the Aramaic language for writing. It is possible that a full education in Aramaic was relatively limited among the Nabataeans and that many people learnt the script and orthography so that they could write their name and a few suitable Aramaic words such as shalam, may he be safe, akir, may he be remembered, barik, may he be blessed, etc., which they could add to their names when carving graffiti. Even so, we occasionally get Arabic forms such as Mavkur instead of Dakir creeping into a graffito, presumably where the author had forgotten the Aramaic word. This is a feature which also occurs in formal inscriptions, where we find not only Arabic loanwords in the Aramaic texts, but even more significantly, grammatical structures such as the use of the Fa'ala uh, conjugation to express wishes, as in Rahimah Allah, may God have mercy upon him, which is normal in Arabic, but not used in Aramaic. This sort of linguistic intrusion suggests a very close link between the, you, in the use of the two languages. When the Romans annexed the Nabataean kingdom <coughs> sorry, in AD 106, they were really more interested in the parts of it in modern Jordan and Syria than the section in Northwest Arabia. This was probably because they already had more or less taken over the south to north trade in Aramaics, etc., transporting the goods by sea, which was quicker and cheaper than the traditional land route. And so they no longer needed Hegra, Madai and Saleh at the northern end of it. Of course, for a hundred years or so, they kept a garrison at Hegra and raised troops from at least one local tribe, the Thamud. But most of their activities in Provincia Arabia were in the Levant. One result of this was that in this northern area, that this northern area became far more Romanized and Greek gradually became the normal written language. Within the first century or so after the annexation in the north, we still find some inscriptions in Nabataean Aramaic, some of them bilinguals with Greek, 
but gradually they become less and less common. By contrast, in Northwest Arabia, Greek barely took hold at all. Of course, there are political inscriptions in Greek at Hegra and elsewhere, as well as military ones in Latin, but these are greatly outnumbered by contemporary texts in Nabataean Aramaic. Even in the middle of the fourth century AD, 250 years after the annexation, the tombstone of the wife of the chief citizen of Hegra was written in near perfect Aramaic. <coughs> I'm so sorry. But by this time, but by this time, it was clear that the situation was changing. Almost a century earlier, a man called Kabu had buried his mother at Hegra with an epitaph ostensibly in Nabataean Aramaic, but in fact in the equivalent of Franglais. The standard expressions like bar and bart, rather than bin and bint, the son and or daughter, of uh, the date and the name of the deity of, uh, are in Aramaic, but much of the rest could be in either Aramaic or Arabic, and certain words and expressions are clearly in Arabic. It would seem that either Ka'abu or the scribe who composed the epitaph was an Arabic speaker with only a sketchy knowledge of Aramaic. It is highly probable that Aramaic still had prestige as a written language, rather as Latin did uh, in Europe until say the mid 18th century. And so even if one wrote in one's spoken vernacular language, one could scatter Latin words, or in this case, Aramaic words and phrases in the text to show one was educated. After a time, many of these words and phrases became fossils with a meaning of their own in the spoken language, like etc., am, pm, infradig, and so on. Interestingly, the fossil which lasted longest was Aramaic bar, meaning son of, instead of bin in genealogies. This survived right up to the beginning of the Islamic period. While in Northwest Arabia, people were beginning to write their spoken Arabic in the Nabataean script, the nomads who had been using their own South Semitic scripts to write their Arabic dialects seemed to have disappeared, or at least they stopped writing. Alas, we have no idea why or how this happened, but in all the tens, tens of thousands of these graffiti, there is not a single reference to Christianity. Although actually, since writing this, my uh, friend and colleague, uh, uh, Ahmed al Jalad has possibly discovered a, a reference to uh, the Redeemer, to Christ as the Redeemer, but uh, he will be writing about that later. Uh, their graffiti show that they were well informed about events in the settled areas, and we know that by the fourth century AD, Christian missionaries were going into the desert to try to convert the nomads. So it is highly likely that if they were still around or still writing, the nomads who carved these graffiti would have been aware of Christianity, especially after the Emperor Constantine decriminalized it in AD 313. And with his support, the Christians became one of the most powerful groups in the empire. Unfortunately, we have no idea why these nomads, nomads either disappeared or stopped writing. But with this disappearance, their script was gradually forgotten and remained on the rocks of the desert noticed by the authors of pre-Islamic Arabic poetry as writing which no one could read. By contrast, exactly at this time, either 322 or 328 AD, we have the first major document in the Arabic language expressed in the Nabataean Aramaic script. This is the famous Anamara inscription discovered in 1901 by two great French epigraphists and explorers, René Dussault and Frédéric Macleur, near the watering place of Anamara in the basalt desert of southern Syria. It served as the lintel over the doorway of a tomb, uh, over the tomb of a man called Marat Kais, not the famous Arab uh, poet Imral Kais, who lived two centuries later. This epitaph described Marat Kais as king of all the Arabs and describes his conquests all over the peninsula as far as Najran on the borders of Yemen, and how he made his sons rulers of the settled peoples and proxies for the Persians and the Romans. It ends, 
no king could match his achievements. The script of this epitaph is still clearly Nabatean Aramaic, though in a developed form. We do not know where the scribe who wrote out the text for the stonemason had learnt the script. It may have been in Syria or in southern Mesopotamia, where the Lechmid or Nasrid kingdom, of which Maruf Qais may have been the second monarch, was developing an Arab polity allied to the Persians. Meanwhile, writing in Arabic, uh, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Meanwhile, writing in Arabic in the Nabatean Aramaic script seems also to have been flourishing in Northwest Arabia, where we find it used in graffiti. Several years ago, the Saudi scholar, Professor Ali al Khaban discovered the ancient route from Alula to the Jordanian border, and presumably further, which he calls the Dabu Bakra. At most of the stopping places along this route, there were large numbers of graffiti in 14 different scripts and dating from possibly the 5th century BC to the Middle Ages, including over 900 Nabataean and Nabateo Arabic texts. These were brilliantly edited by my friend and colleague Leila Neme and were published in Riyadh in 2018. I would strongly recommend all those interested in the development of the Arabic script from Nabataean to read her brilliant introduction to these texts and see the reference on the screen. These graffiti give us snapshots of a script development which is otherwise invisible to us because it was taking place in texts written with pen and ink on papyrus or potsherds. Although no do documents of these have yet been discovered in Northwest Arabia, we know that they must have existed because there is no incentive for a script to develop when it's used only on stone. This can be seen in the graffiti of the nomads, where there are, of course, differences in handwriting, but no recognizable and consistent development of letter shapes. In formal inscriptions, as in ancient South Arabian Musnad, there can be calligraphic changes of fashion in the letter shapes, but not the sort of development which we see in the Nabataean script, where the letter shapes and the joins between the letters are exactly those which make it easier and quicker to write with a pen. This is a process which goes right back to our first evidence of the Nabataean script, which developed from Imperial Aramaic, in which each letter was separate without joins, and the only letters with the same form were D and R, Dal and Re, Ra. So the development of which we get glimpses in the graffiti on the Dabu Bakra and elsewhere is only the later part of a process which had been going on since the Nabataeans sent their letter to Antigonus uh, at the end of the fourth century BC, a development driven by the convenience of the writer with pen and ink. However, alongside this, we need to remember that all literate people carry many forms of each letter in their, their memory because they need to be able to decipher many different handwritings. And in our day, the different, form, form, different fonts or the varied artistic forms of writing on shop signs or posters. In addition, with graffiti, we need to take into account each individual's choice of letter form, his or her skill in, in carving and the circumstances in which they were doing it, how skilled they were, how much time they had, was someone shouting, come on, we're leaving, how bad the flies were that day, how good that tool was, were they striving for a calligraphic effect, etc. All these things affect the form of the script in an individual graffito. And it is for this reason that I have always argued that the use of letter shapes in graffiti as a way of dating text is pointless and likely to be misleading. Uh, here you can see uh, on, on the screen a graffito from the Dabul Bakra in which the author has used four different forms of the letter B from the very calligraphic, and by this time ancient, number one, to the very, very developed, number four. Fortunately, some of these graffiti include dates, so we can see in very general terms developments in the script their authors were using. One of the more curious of these is that the, uh, the letters Dal and Ra, as I said, uh, 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 as I said earlier, these started off 
as the only two letters with identical shapes in Imperial Aramaic and classical calligraphic Nabataean, and the reader just had to work out which was which from the context. Gradually, as the script developed, their shapes diverged, and it became quite clear which was a Dal and which was a Ra. Ironically, it was at this time that it became common to put a dot over the Dal, though there seem to have been different views on this, and in a small minority of the graffiti, the dot is placed over the Ra. Thus, at a time when the shape of the letters was already distinct, a dot on the Dal became the norm. Fortunately, this was not taken over when the Arabic script developed its system of dots to distinguish letters of the same shape. Yet, even in the first Islamic century, in graffiti, letters on papyri, and even in some very early Qurans, when only some of the letters were dotted, the choice of which letters received dots often seems bizarre to us. For very often, the letters which are dotted could easily have been read correctly even without the dot, whereas those without dots are more difficult to work out. Is this the legacy of the Nabataean Dal with its unnecessary dot, I wonder? Um, not seriously. Um, of course, as I've uh, already hinted, the Nabataean Aramaic script was most unsuitable to express the 28 consonants of the Arabic language. It had started off with, with 22 Aramaic letters, only two of which, Dal and Ra, uh, had had the same form. But during its development between the third and seventh centuries AD, more and more letters came to have indistinguishable forms, at least at the beginning and middle of words, until by the revelation of Islam, there were only 16 different shapes to represent the 28 Arabic consonants. So no wonder dots were needed. And yet a certain snobbery persisted in being able to read fluently without the help of dots. Nabia Abbott in 1939 cites a certain Abdullah ibn Tahir, governor of Khorasan, who died in AD 844-845, who, quote, when presented with a piece of elaborate penmanship exclaimed, how beautiful this would be if there were not so much coriander seed uh, scattered over it, meaning the diacritical dots. While as late as the 7th century, 17th century, Haji Khalifa advised, quote, omitting vowels and diacritical points, especially in addressing persons of consequence and refinement in regard to whom it would be impolite to suppose that they did not have a perfect knowledge of the written language. While it's clear that the development of the Nabataean script and its use to write Arabic was going on in Northwest Arabia and possibly in the South near Najran, the earliest inscriptions we had in what we would recognize the Arabic script are found in Syria. At first sight, this is curious, but we have to take into account two factors. One is that there have been expeditions searching for inscriptions in Syria for more than 170 years, while such ex expeditions in the peninsula are much more recent. The second explanation was suggested by Leila Neme, and that is that the Jafnids or Hassanids took the script with them when they moved from Arabia to Syria in the sixth century AD and used it in the administration of the kingdom they set up there. This is supported by the text of one of these inscriptions, a graffito from Jebel Seis in southern Syria, which says that its author was sent there in AD 528 or 9 by the Jafnid king al -Harith. We know that the Nabatua Arabic script was used by pagans, Jews and Christians in the pre-Islamic period because we have graffiti by individuals from all these groups. We are also told in Hadith that a number of the early Muslims were literate at the time of the revelation, including, of course, Zayd ibn Thabit, one of the prophets and annuences, who, it is said, learned to write Arabic among the Jews of Medina. However, a curious feature of Arabic in the peninsula is that while writing was used for ordinary day-to-day -day tasks, such as correspondence, uh, invoices, receipts, notes, lists, treaties, etc., there seems to have been a very strong feeling that culturally important things, such as religion, literature, history, and genealogy, should only be transmitted orally. This sounds reminiscent of the Nabataeans but they had no choice because at that time they had not started to write Arabic in the Aramaic script. 
and apparently did not consider using the scripts of the nomads. This preference for oral transmission is, I would suggest, a very strong choice, which can be illustrated by a comparison with the Tuareg society in North Africa up to about 30 years ago. The Tuareg have their own script, the Tefina, which in former times was used purely for fun. Children's games, graffiti, secret notes between lovers, etc. However, their society remained resolutely oral and they did not use the script for anything of practical use. <clears throat> if a Tuareg needed to send a letter, he or she would find someone who had been to school and ask them to write it in Arabic or French, even though the Tuareg recipient would then have to find someone who had been to school to read and translate it for them. The Tuareg have an incredibly rich oral literature, but when an anthropologist once suggested that they could write it down in their traditional script, the suggestion was greeted with horror. For oral literature is constantly fresh, constantly changing with each recitation, and there is no such thing as the correct text of a poem or story. Similarly, genealogy is still used among the Bedouin as a way of explaining social and political events. So if two tribes which have been thought to be closely related fall out, the genealogy is re-explained to show that actually they were not as nearly uh, uh, closely related as had been thought. Writing down genealogies would of course make this impossible. In religion, polytheism by its very nature tolerant of differences of belief, and so variations in the stories of gods and goddesses as they were retold orally by different people over generations were perfectly acceptable. On the other hand, monotheism is inherently intolerant of variations in belief, witness the constant quarrels and wars about theological niceties. And so the Jews and Christians required a written scripture, though even that did not stop theological quarreling. The result of this tradition passing on culturally important things orally meant that while the revelations received by the prophet were di dictated by him to an amanuensis who wrote them down, they had immediately to be learnt by heart and transmitted orally to his followers, who would also learn them by heart. Inevitably, as with poems and genealogies, this meant that small changes in wording could creep in as more and more people heard the revelations committed them to memory and then recited them to others. However, in the years after the Prophet's death, as Islam was established, first in the Hejaz and Yemen, and then throughout the Middle East, North Africa and beyond, the dangers for a monotheism of having lots of slightly different versions of the divine revelations became apparent. And despite serious opposition, the third of the righteous caliphs of Ma'an ibn Affan uh, decreed that a definitive text of the Quran be established and written down. However, in the earliest surviving copies of the Quran, as well as many uh, from the first three Islamic centuries, no dots are used to distinguish Ba from Nun, Jim from Kha, etc. Despite the fact that the earliest Arabic papyri and graffiti from 22 and 24 AH respectively show that a generally accepted system of dots was already in use. I would suggest that this is because the transmission of the Quran continued through learning it by heart, and so the undotted consonantal text served simply as an aid memoir. We cannot prove this, but it seems a possible situation explanation. In the first two Islamic centuries, the transmission of culturally important materials continued to be oral although scholars and students kept often copious notes to which they could refer. Gradually, however, partly through increasing contact with other literate cultures in Arabia, in Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Iran, etc., Arabic became one of the foremost literary languages of the world, and its script was used to write not only Arabic, but languages from the Atlantic to the South China Sea. Over the centuries, the Arabic script has developed in numerous different and often very beautiful ways, to the extent that some of the most elaborate and artistically pleasing are almost indecipherable for those who do not already know what they say, harking back to the earliest Qurans. Today, seeing and using this most beautiful and expressive script in all its multitudinous forms, 
it is interesting to reflect on its development across 2000 years from another sinuous and beautiful alphabet, Nabataean Aramaic. Thank you very much. Dr. McDonald, thank you. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, if you could um, unshare your screen, we can, uh, uh, I have to say as someone who spent, uh, started learning Arabic over 40 years ago, I found that absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Um, if we have got a, you very kindly said that you, you be prepared to answer any questions. We've got about 10 minutes left. If anyone would like to uh, ask a question, please let me know. You can either ask it in the chat box and I'll ask it for you, or let me know, <coughs> uh, let me know by um, putting, putting a thumbs up in your, in your box and you can ask it personally if you want. Uh, you can unmute yourself. So I'm scanning, I'm scanning the views to see, looking for the, uh, if there are any, any questions. I, I mean, what, 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 you know, so uh, what surprises me is how late Arabic developed. <laughs> I have to own up to being completely uh, unaware that the written Arabic took such a long time to, to uh, evolve, uh, as it were. Um, uh, so that that was a fascinating, uh, fascinating insight. Has anyone got a question for Dr. McDonald? Um, I'm just looking, I'm scanning away here. Peter Harrigan is in the chat chat box, I think. Peter Harrigan, right. Peter, would you like to ask a question? Yes, thank you very much indeed, Michael. That was really fascinating. Um, you, all of your references refer to uh, rock as a, as a medium. What about a uh, faunal kind of inscriptions by way of wasm tribal marks where, where does that fit into your narrative on letters and and um um or, or origins of language the camel markings deployed by nomads could you sort of elucidate on on the significance yes. of wasm if there is any <laughs> yes well wasm is a a non non-linguistic way of uh uh, expressing possession. So you see, normally it's not personal possession, it, it's uh, a tribal or sub-tribal uh, possession of animals. Uh, but it can be also used, for instance, in non-literate cultures um, on the graves, of, of uh, on a grave of somebody. Um, so very often, uh, when I first started working in, in the six, in the seventies, um, in, in the, the deserts in Jordan and, uh, and Syria, uh, you would find a modern Bedouin grave, uh, with just the wasm on it because, uh, they, they, they were non-literate there, there. Um, and certainly they would, uh, before they learned to write an alternative to, uh, making rock drawings, which is incredibly difficult. I mean, to make some of them are very, very beautiful, but you make one mistake and you can't rub it out uh, on a rock. Um, and so uh, other people would, would just put their, their wasm on as a way of uh, passing the time probably. And so you have areas which are covered with lots of different wasms. And in fact, in Jordan, uh, Qusayr Amra, uh, the uh, Umayyad, uh, uh, the desert palace there, uh, the front wall is is absolutely covered. Every inch uh, is covered in wasu. Uh, and um, I think, you know, it's, it's a bit like graffiti. Once, once somebody puts something, then you have something, oh, I want to do it too, and, and, and so on. I don't know, but I don't think there is any linguistic uh, uh, meaning in them. And because they have basic the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, formed from very basic shapes, uh, straight lines, crosses, circles, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and many of the South Semitic uh, letters, uh, which the uh, which, for instance, the people who wrote Safiitic, the, nomad, uh, the nomads who wrote in the in the, the North Arabian deserts, uh, used many of those letters are also fairly basic shapes. Um, and so some people, including T. Lawrence actually, suggested that the, uh, uh, the wasum were either taken from these ancient letters 
all the letters were formed from was who, but actually um, the, there seems to be no, no uh, truth in that, I'm afraid. Yeah. Michael, I wonder if I could ask you, when, when did voweling um, sort of appear in, in, in written form? I mean... Uh... Well, it's, um, it depends which group of uh, scripts you're dealing with. In the Phoenicio-Aramaic scripts, um, so from which all, all our modern alphabets except one uh, derive, including Arabic uh, alphabet. Um, uh, it's in Phoenician, there are no vowels at all. Then um, Aramaic started writing uh, using wow and ya uh, uh, as vowels and eventually alif. But for some reason, alif was only used at the end of words uh, or the beginning of words, not in the middle. Um, and this was a tradition which went on very, very late, actually. So you have this Aramaic, uh, the, the, the vocalization starting in Aramaic in, say, the, the ninth century um, BC. And it's not until uh, the fifth century AD that people start putting alif in the middle of, of words in, in Arabic, writing when they're writing Arabic. Um, it's, there's been some, there's some taboo about using alif uh, as a vowel in the middle of a word. So it started um, uh, very early putting in vowels, but they, uh, but in the South Arabian, uh, South Semitic script, they never used vowels, um, basically. Right, thank you. A anyone else got a, a question before I allow Dr. McDonald to get back to? I'm sure a well deserved <laughs> dinner and a glass of, glass of wine. Um, I see four chats, but I think uh, yeah. lots of fascinating talks, but no questions. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, well, Michael, I want to thank you on behalf of the of the Saudi British Society for what I I was absolutely riveted. I didn't think. You could hold my attention. I've just been reading a, a, a whole load of spy novels, which I've written me, and this is this, this kind of got me in the same sort of way. You know, the, how did this, what happened? It was a, it was a fascinating story. Yes. And I want to thank you on behalf of the society for uh, taking us through that story in a very vivid and uh, uh, clear way. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, I, on behalf of the society. I need to thank you very much. They can all use their reactions buttons to clap or <laughs> they're all clapping. So thank, thank you, you very, very much, very much. Uh, thank you. For, for, for your lecture. We, we, we thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, well, thank you. I enjoyed giving it. To, so uh, thank you very much for your very uh, kind uh, invitation and uh, your, your, your kind uh, uh, reactions. <laughs> And thank, and thank you all, uh, all members of our society and those who are guests for, uh, uh, for, for joining us this evening. So I wish you all uh, a good night and hope you'll join us for our uh, next talk uh, next month, which we will uh, inform you of in due course. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. <laughs> Bye.